Okay, I am live. I'm going to go there so I don't see those rolling across. And I'm going to paste that. I'm going to post that. And I'm going to, I just have to tap it. Pin comment. Okay, so hi, how's it going? For those of you that are re-watching this, um, please know that while I am crazy, I'm not talking to myself here. Well, I kind of am. Um, I'm doing a live broadcast of videos, so all these comments are rolling across the screen. But of course, once I save it, those go away. So it just looks like I'm, you know, talking to myself. Um, we're going to give everybody a few minutes to roll in. Right now, I am live on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. So you can watch me from anywhere. I'll also say if the video drops off for any of you, most likely on Facebook or YouTube versus Instagram, um, you can come find me on those other places. And, of course, I'll be saving this live recording afterwards. Okay. So we are here to talk about how to make a nourishing herbal infusion. And these are really easy. Um, and I've made a lot of videos for a lot of specific herbs on how to do it. But I always have a lot of questions in my comment section. So I thought I would, you know, just jabber about what they're all about. So I have two cameras going here. See me looking back at both. I've got two phones. <laughs> one is broadcasting to Facebook and YouTube, and one is broadcasting to Instagram. So I think I'm just going to have to stare at the center of the two phones. Like right now, it looks like I'm looking you in the eye, but really, really, I'm looking at the crack between the two phones. <laughs> so that'll work, and it'll probably help me <clears throat> not get distracted um, in the comment section. Um, okay, so what is a nourishing herbal infusion? Let me get my stool set up here because. My feet hurt when I stand on them too long because I spent my whole life walking. Uh, a nourishing herbal infusion is basically where you take specific herbs, and I'll get to those, and you infuse them for a long period of time with boiling water, right? You're like, well, that just sounds like tea, but it's not. The difference between a tea and a nourishing herbal infusion is usually the herbs you're using, but also the volume of herb you're using per the hot water, right? So like with tea, you've just got tea bags and you're brewing it. Even if you're making something like sun tea, you're maybe using, what, 10, 15 tea bags at most. When we are making a nourishing herbal infusion, we that. I make mine a half gallon at a time. You can also use, let me grab this. You can also use a quart jar at a time. Um, but I, I drink a lot of them and it's not just me that drinks them. So I make them a half gallon at a time. But the difference is, look at how much herb is in that. It, for this um, half gallon amount, it's two ounces of herb per half gallon of water or, or half gallon quart, whatever, that's on a quart. <laughs> I had it right the first time. Um, or it's one ounce per quart. Some herbs vary and I'll get to those. Um, but then you let it sit for a very long time in the way like tea, you know, you maybe got like 10, 15 minutes, maybe 30 if you forgot about it and then it's too bitter. With nourishing herbal infusions, we're going to let this sit for the better part of 24 hours before we strain it. So that is the difference between a tea and a nourishing herbal infusion. But what is it actually? actually doing right like what's the difference of letting it set longer well i mean a lot of you can probably guess that it makes it you know like stronger and whatnot and it does um but what's actually happening and the, and the reason why you have to use dried plant matter is that that hot water when it goes over it is allowing the cellular structure of the plant matter to break open i'm talking on a really microscopic level you need to break open those rigid cells to open up and get the mineral and medicinal properties and nutrients and things that you're after. And so look how dark that is. When it started, and this is a nettle infusion, it was just clear water. And what's happened as the water cools, it acts like a poultice. But it's important, it's important to use dried plant matter when you are making a nourishing herbal infusion, because if you don't, if you don't, what happens is you make weak broth, right? Because think about how a plant is, it's wet right? It's wet when it's fresh. It's got moisture in it. So when you pour water over it, there's nowhere for the moisture to be absorbed into, right? It's just hot water around a plant. And if you were making a broth, you would keep boiling until the plant matter broke down. Um, and when that happens, when you know, like, okay, take a carrot, for example, a carrot is hard, you can snap it, crack it, I probably should have had a carrot for an example. <laughs> um, but 
the reason it's hard is because its cellular structure is still intact, right? Like eating a fully cooked carrot is easier for your body to digest and get vitamin A and other minerals from than it is from a raw carrot, even if you juice it, um, because that cellular structure is still intact. And you have to cook it for a long time until it softens up, right? And then your body can use it because you've broken down the cellular structure of the plant, right? And gotten to all those vitamins and minerals and everything that you're after. Um, so when you make a nourishing herbal infusion, with dried plant matter, what happens is it's got room to absorb. I said that word long, didn't I? It's got room to absorb um, the nutrients and, uh, sorry, it has room to absorb the water into itself, into the cellular structure, and then it busts open. And then as the water cools down, <laughs> as the water cools down, what happens is it extracts, right? But you can't do that from fresh plant matter. You can make a weak broth or you can just keep boiling it and make a real broth. So that is a really important thing about nourishing herbal infusions. And I bring that up because I see a lot of people, even herbalists that are like, I've been practicing and I took all these courses and I'm making a nourishing herbal infusion with like fresh nettle or fresh comfrey or fresh something. And I'm like, no, you're making a weak broth because like infusions 101, the plant matter needs to be dry so it can break open that cellular structure easy and be absorbed. So um, that is what an infusion is. So now I'm going to talk about, I've got a board over here you'll see me looking at. Um, I'm trying to keep myself and my magpie brain that likes to dump out all kinds of information and facts on track. So I'm not on here for like two and a half hours or more. <laughs> um, so let me take a drink of my Linden Nourishing Infusion. She helps me not lose my voice when I talk for a long time. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk about general herbs used and herbs that we don't want to use. Um, and this section, I'm not really going to tell you like specific herbs yet. I'll talk about those later. I'm just going to talk about the type of herb. Um, I'm always making myself stand when I have a little thing that I could pop up on here. Pop up on. Okay, so. When we think about a nourishing herbal infusion, it's important to use herbs that are nutritive, that are tonifying, that are more in the food realms more often than not than they are in like the volatile realms and the medicinal realms. Not that these aren't medicinal, but so for example, I would use nettle. Nettle is a food. You can um, pick her when she's young. She's delicious cooked. She's a really traditional food for a lot of different countries all over the world. She's just a spring greens, right? But you wouldn't want to use something like, let's say, lavender or chamomile or lemon balm. Now, what are the things that those three herbs I named, what, what's the one thing they have in common? Uh, as far as like sensory wise, they smell really strong. They have a strong scent. Lavender is a strong smell. Chamomile is a strong smell. All these things that have strong smells, mints, anything that you're like, wow, that's really fragrant is not meant for a nourishing herbal infusion, but for a tea. And that's because these plants have high volatile organic compounds. Um, and that's what the market has deemed essential oils. And I'm not going to go into that a whole lot. But basically what happens if you make an infusion out of these, um, you ever made like a cup of chamomile tea and like forgot about it and like left the bags in there and you go back like later in the day or maybe the next day and you notice that it kind of looks like an oil slick, like a parking lot after it rained, right? You can see like the shiny rainbow. What's happened is that water has extracted those volatile organic compounds, VOCs, and now it's dangerous. Now, if you drink that, you can kill your gut health. You can have all kinds of ramifications on your organs and your kidneys. And that's why with, um, oh, Water's already boiling. Let me turn it down. Um, <laughs> not ready for that. Um, that's why it's important with those really volatile herbs that have a lot of smell to them, a lot of scent to them, that you only make a quick brewed tea, right? Like a perfect chamomile cup of tea isn't steeped for more than like eight or nine minutes. After that, it gets too strong and bitter, right? Because you're extracting too many of these oils. However, when you make something like nettle or oat straw or all the other herbs I'm going to talk about, they don't have much of a scent, right? I mean, they have a smell, but they're not like, wow, that smells like lavender. They don't have a lot of really high VOCs in them. So when you make a nourishing herbal infusion, you don't have that risk. You don't run that risk of drinking these volatile organic compounds and too concentrated of matter and hurting your gut health and your body and your organs and your endocrine system and all these things. Um, so, though, so when you think about a nourishing herbal infusion ask yourself does this herb have a lot of smell is it something that's like a food is it something that i could pretty much eat on a regular basis like um 
oat straw, for example, right? Oat straw is just the straw that they harvest after they harvest oatmeal. It's a food, right? It's not going to hurt you. It's something that you can use on a regular basis pretty often. And it's just like if you ate oatmeal for breakfast, right? But you wouldn't want to grab something that you're like, whoa, well, I read about this herb. And even though it doesn't have a very strong smell, I know that like, if I use it for like more than a little bit at a time, it could hurt my kidneys and things like that. I don't personally work with herbs like that. I don't like herbs that are that that heal based on poison. I like herbs that support based on nutrition, right? They support your body's natural function instead of uh, uh, forcing it into doing something. And we're really conditioned to see um, a reaction as healing because of the pharmaceutical industry, right? We're like, we take a pill, we feel different, we're healed. You're not actually feeling, you're not actually healed. You're feeling different, right? And so, um, okay, so when you think of herbs to use, remember, think of nutrition, safe for daily use. And then if you think of herbs not to use, think of like, oh, it has a really strong smell, right? So a really strong fragrant, like you could use it for potpourri. Those are the ones that are best for tea. Um, okay, so let's see. Next up, equipment needed, right? So... I hate the word equipment because it sounds so intimidating. Like you're going to have to go out and buy all this stuff, but you're really, I mean, you're going to have to buy some stuff, you know, <laughs> but you could probably find most of it secondhand used. You might have a lot of it on you already. Um, the most important thing that you're going to need besides jars, you'll need jars. Um, make sure that you're using canning jars. Resist the urge to use like old spaghetti jars and stuff because those aren't really meant for more than single use by the companies. I mean, I've canned with them successfully, you know, because I know some canner is going to be like, I use them all the time. But sometimes they shatter. They're just not as sturdy as the ones like a ball jar or something like that that's meant to be used again and again. Um, and that's because we're going to be um, pouring boiling hot water in these and we don't want them to shatter because they're like a really weak glass. All right. So you need yourself some jars. And here's the good news. Some of you might know who started the garden for the first time or had a real big garden um, that the um, <laughs> that there was a there's a shortage of everything the past couple of years. Right. You're like, what the hell? Why is that on shortage? Well, canning jars was one of them. But here's the funny thing. People panic bought these. And I understand a lot of people didn't do the canning they thought they would or their garden didn't produce as much as they thought it would. You know, things like that. I bet right now, like I bet my last five bucks that you could hop onto like a Facebook marketplace for your area and be like, looking for used canning jars <laughs> and you could probably get them like half off or less because people have all these like canning jars they hoarded and they're like, okay, well I'm over it. I'm not as afraid of what's going on now. I'm used to the new normal or things like that. And you can likely get that for cheap, uh, a little cheaper than running to the store, but they are back in stock on shelves now. They're not, they're not um, a shortage anymore. Uh, okay. So you'll need yourself a jar. Uh, should I have this stuff move closer? <laughs> then, you need a scale. I don't care if it's digital or if it's an old school, you know, baggy way in scale, whatever you've got. You need a scale that's capable of weighing out ounces. Um, you really, really don't want to eye these nourishing herbal infusions when a lot of people are like, well, I don't feel like they made any difference for me. I'm like, did you weigh them out? <laughs> did you weigh them out or did you eye it? Did you think, oh, I think about a cup is enough. The thing is, is that you really need to have that one ounce ratio to one quart boiling water ratio or it's not going to get full saturation, right? Like if it's a little bit over, it's not that big a deal. If it's a, if it's a little bit under, you actually miss out on a lot of nutrition and medicinal properties that could be in that water. And honestly, these scales these days at Walmart are like five, 10 bucks and they last forever you know and they're handy to have in your um in your kitchen for other things too um and again if you're on a budget throw an ad up on your local marketplace you know be like i am looking for a used kitchen scale you know i just need something that can weigh out ounces and i know you're gonna have some people be like oh <laughs> trying to sell some shit but no you know you're not looking for like a like a, a dope scale you're looking for you know just a used kitchen scale and you maybe could get it for a couple bucks um so other than that these are things that are also handy to have um oh, i'm gonna lose my pillow i have to have a pillow because i have no ass it's like i'm a frog standing up and so if i just sit on that wood it will like like i'll i'll cut through my own flesh with my butt bones <laughs> so i have to have a pillow um okay so these are things that are also handy to have but 
you don't have to go out and buy them. Uh, I know the times right now are tough. And for a lot of us, they were tough before things got tough, right? Um, but a canning funnel, a canning funnel is really handy because when you go to strain, which I'll show you in a little bit, uh, when you go to strain or anything like that, it's just really handy for not making a mess. Uh, and then speaking of straining, and I'll, I'll show you how to strain a little bit. Um, you have anything that you have that will allow you to remove the plant matter from the water will work, right? It doesn't have to be super fancy. You can use like a mesh sieve. Even it could even be a plastic one. It's something you have in your kitchen for cooking. You could use, maybe you have a nut milk bag. <laughs> I swear to God, that's what they call them. And it makes me laugh. It's just a micron mesh bag for like straining. It's food grade. You can toss it in your washing machine. They're really handy. They last forever. Um, you can also use, I hodgepodge stuff together. So my favorite combination is this random tea strainer that came with this Christmas present, like tea mug I got forever ago. And I pop it in my jar, right? And then I put my funnel over top of it and then I can just dump it in and through. That's super handy, but you could do the same thing with the strainer bag, you know, like you could put um, the straining bag inside of it. And then you could just strain that way. Or um, you can use this, but I would suggest doing it over a bowl because it'll, it'll spill out, you know. But do it over a bowl and strain it that way. You could even use, um, like, a clean um, tea cloth. Uh, you know, these are like, um, this is a kitchen towel. But, like, you know how it doesn't have, like, the fuzzy pieces on it. It's, like, solid. You could use, like, um, cheesecloth or muslin cloth, too. Anything like that that you can strain the plant matter out with is, is all you really need. Um, okay, so that's the equipment you'll need. Oh, oh, it says on the board now I'm supposed to make an infusion. So let me get my water boiling. So let's actually make one, right? You've heard me jabber about enough. Um, I'm going to make a comfrey infusion. So let me grab my comfrey. You're going to hear that teapot start to scream for me. I always forget to put that in there. And I'm going to weigh out. <laughs> okay, water's boiling enough. I'm going to weigh out one ounce. All right. So, always take you. If you go fast, you'll be like, oh, there's two ounces. <laughs> when you were meaning to weigh out one ounce. So, it's one ounce of herb for the most part per quart jar. All right. Are you ready? Boiling water over the top. Ooh, filled it too much, but that's okay. It'll absorb. So now I'm going to grab a butter knife. Butter knives work really well because they don't like spill as much as a spoon or like anything else does. And so I'm kind of just going to make a mess. There's no way around it. Okay. See, but check it out. If I didn't stir it, see the headspace there? there would have been a lot less water. So like you won't get as much infusion as if you would stir it because it just helps it um, absorb in a little bit better. And then what's that? Maybe half a cup? Half a cup I would have lost out on. And that doesn't sound like much, but these cups, these quart jars when full, hold about four and a half cups of water anyhow. Um, and if you um, go to strain it out and you take all the plant matter out, even if you squeeze it, you're really only going to end up with like two, two and a half cups, right? Because the herb that's in there, the, um, the place, that's the right word, the volume of the, the water that could go in, right? You only have so much room. Um, so now you're going to cap it. And I want you to resist the urge to shake this. This is hot as shit. <laughs> and you put a canning lid on there. So if you shake it, the pressure is going to make it go. <sighs> it's going to like spray out, right? Like it's going to burn you. It's going to burn your hand. It's going to be a situation. You'll drop it. You'll break it. And you'll never make an infusion again. <laughs> so you don't want to do that. Um, and so now you're just going to let this sit. Let's say it's 12 o'clock here where I'm at. Uh, I'm just going to let this sit until 12 o'clock tomorrow. Once it cools down, 
like to room temperature, I pop it in my fridge until the next day. Um, that way it doesn't just sit out on the counter, but like, you don't want to put it in there when it's really hot because it can, it's hard on your fridge, but also, you know, like, I don't know if you know this, but if you put like soups and sauces in a fridge when it's hot, it will sour the sauce. So it can make food go bad and it's really hard on your fridge. So you want to make sure it's like really cooled down. So yeah, if you're using a quart jar, it's one ounce of most herbs to um, four cups of boiling water. So quart jars make it handy because you don't really have to be like wonder or measure out your boiling water. You just put your herb in there and then fill it up. But if you're making a half gallon like I make, you um, typically want to do two ounces of herb and then fill it all the way up. So the next part is to show you, let's pretend that over there looks really hot and let me take a drink. The next part that I'm going to show you is how to strain an infusion. And it's pretty easy, but a lot of people are like, how'd you do that? Because <laughs> they watch in my story section. So you need an empty jar, obviously. You can strain it into a bowl if you want, but I'm going to show you how I do it. So I'm going to take my tea strainer, my quart, my bob, my quart, my canning <laughs> my canning funnel it wasn't even close my court my bob that's just what i'm going to call them now sometimes these lids will stick um because it's like you're canning right so what happens is it gets stuck on there because as it cools down you'll hear it go you know if you've ever canned it it suctions it so you're just going to take your little can opener which has a natural, you know, a natural, a naturally occurring bottle opener, <laughs> which has a, you know, a bottle opener on it. And then just get your lid off like that. I suggest you shake this before you pour it or it's a big clump and it doesn't want to like come out. Well. So, all right, are we ready? I'm having to line everything up with two cameras, two cameras. Uh, okay. So usually I pour off like the bulk of the, um, the infusion first and look how dark that is this is nettle infusion um she's one of my favorites and i'm going to talk about a lot of the herbs that we can use that are typically used and like what they're generally used for is uh yeah after this <laughs> i got a board keeping me on track um okay and you know it's really handy because it's pre-strained it's ready to drink although i most infusions taste best when they're really cold you know put them in ice put them in the fridge things like that um and now it's also important to know that these are like food, right? So let's say I made soup for dinner last night. It was delicious. Um, I ate it today and I'm probably going to have it again tomorrow for lunch. But after that, I'm going to probably feed it to my pigs. <laughs> Not that it's gone rotten, but generally like three days is the rule of thumb for most food in the fridge, right? Like after that, you're like, oh, I'm not going to feel good about myself if I eat that. Like I might not die, but so this is food. So most nourishing herbal infusions need to be drank up within three days. And if you don't drink them all, don't feel bad. Feed it to a plant, especially nettle. Give it to something outside. It's got a lot of nutrients in it. Um, so now I'm going to make a mess. No, it wants to strain more. Okay. Shake, 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 shake. I'm making all the extra liquid go out so I can do that. Now, typically I'll do that. And you can also, like, sometimes I'll, let me see if I can make an ass out of myself. Sometimes I'll come over here and then I just kind of, lean it up against the cupboard right then because it, it has support um and then it's just going to drip and sometimes i'll flip them up fast before it's strained out most of it right but there it is and you can see i'll be able to press it out i probably won't get even if i press it and let it drip for a while i probably won't get much past like right here and i filled it all the way up right with water but remember the herb that we put in it displaces water and so when i make a half gallon i end up with where's my other measure i end up with about five and a half six cups out of eight you know and so um if you do really get into drinking them and you get your family and friends into drinking them with you whoever's in your household um making a half gallon of time can be drank up in a day like that um uh, okay so i'm not gonna let that well actually you know what i'm just gonna move this out of my way okay so let's clean up here and then i'm gonna talk about 
what type of herbs that are typically used. And um, I'm not going to go like super, super in depth about each herb. I'm going I'm to give you a good amount of information, but that way I'm not on here for like 2.5 hours or something. Um, so, and I also, I've done a lot of individual videos on how to make nursing herbal infusions for specific herbs. So go check those out on my YouTube or on my Instagram. Um, a lot of them are also posted to my Facebook page wall and stuff like that. But any that I haven't covered, you should probably be on the lookout for those new videos in like the next week or so. Because I got like, I'm like, oh, there's like four infusion videos I haven't made. So um, I'll give you more in-depth of look at those herbs then. Uh, okay, so... Let's talk about some plants. Now, there are a lot of options for making nourishing herbal infusions, and I'm just showing you like some of them. Um, and then I'm just gonna kind of grab some stuff over here too, because I can use this too. Okay, let's separate this by what they do. So we've got a bunch of jars in the way. <laughs> let me let me sit down. Okay. So you heard me talk about nettle. Oh my gosh. I'm also short and this is a tall stool. So I feel like I just mounted a fucking horse. Um, okay. So. Okay. Let's talk about nettle. I'm drinking Linden. I'll get to her. So nettle is a really amazing one. She's a typical infusion that people start with. And then they're like, oh, I don't want to drink that. Here's the thing. Most people, when you first start drinking nettle infusion, she will not taste good to you. But it's really interesting. The thing is, our taste buds, if they're not utilized, go to sleep. And you could even, I could even nerd out on like how that happens in your stomach for like digestive receptors. If it's not used to a specific food, like wild food and stuff like that, yeah, they actually go to sleep and you get less nutrition, but you start eating wild food, these things wake up. Anyhow, so the same thing happens to your taste buds. You are not used to the vast amount of minerals and nutrition that are found in nettle infusion. So your taste buds don't know what to do. Give it a week. Drink it for a week straight, and suddenly you're going to be like, I crave that flavor. It doesn't taste like that any longer. Also, pro tip, you're not letting it infuse long enough. <laughs> you need to let nettle infusion out of all of them definitely infuse for 24 hours. Um, when you only let it go for like five or six hours, it has a really like chlorophyll-like taste, like you're eating grass, and it's kind of like bitter. However, if you let it go like for the full 24 hours like it needs to, and then you strain it, it'll be nice and dark like the stuff I showed you. And it will have like, it almost smells really cold. It's like drinking milk. Um, it's because it has a lot of calcium in it. So it has that same sensation when you're drinking it. But nettle is amazing. She's a powerhouse of nutrition. She has more nutrition in her than blue algae does. That's insane. She also is fantastic for adrenal support, chronic fatigue syndrome, supporting um, low thyroid function, and just generally like giving your body the nutrition that it needs. So nettle is a fantastic one that I really recommend having in a rotation. And don't worry when I'm done jabbering about herbs i'm going to tell you all about like how that rotation would work and how to get into the habit of it um so that is nettle um and then another common one let me talk about her because i'm drinking it right now she's here somewhere there she is no that's oat straw oh, right in front of me snake it would have bit me <laughs> right in front of me i mean right in front of me um this is linden infusion oh yeah i forgot to tell you I did this handy thing where, okay, if you're making a nettle infusion, it's one quart per, uh, or one ounce per one quart, right? Okay, so if you're making a linden infusion, it's half ounce per quart because she's a stronger one. She's in the bloom leaf family, and she'll, uh, you don't need as much of her. You don't need as much of her. And linden is one that we re-brew. I'm going to cover this stuff and let you like, I'll, I'll give you some tips so you don't have to try to remember all this on your own. Um, this is one that we re-brew. That means after I strain the linden out of my infusion jar, I'm going to take that linden and I'm going to put it in cold water. I'm going to bring it up to a boil and I'm going to put it back in the jar and let it infuse again. And we do that because it breaks down her cellular structure even further to get out her mucosal properties. Um, I know that sounds gross, but it means she's slimy and it's not like she's like a little bit of a thick drink but she's not like 
stuck in your mouth slimy but she's a fantastic anti-inflammatory and so she's an anti-inflammatory because she gets into your body and she coats all these aspects you know primarily your digestive tract but she's really good for anybody who's got sore aches muscles joint issues but she's also a fantastic anti inflammatory i mean not anti-inflammatory but um um oh geez she's antiviral and she's good for supporting her immune system there we go i got stuck on that anti word um but she is antiviral she's fantastic for fevers and she's a really safe one a lot of people um feel safe enough to give her to kids you know linden tea a lot of people grew up with that it's really common she's in the food realm because um her buds and everything are edible people like fry them up in the spring when her little leaf buds come out they're delicious and so this is a first brew when i make my second brew it'll actually be like a darker orange color um and so the first one is arguably better as an anti antiviral and stuff like that you know good for your immune system the second one is when you really break her down um and you get to the like um anti-inflammatory aspects right because you're getting more out of that cellular structure um okay so that's why i drink her when i do these long videos or any of you that have like joined me for like my four hour long two day in a row <laughs> uh, so in like 48 hours i'll talk for eight hours about everything that's available in my shop during shop updates and i would literally lose my voice if i wasn't drinking linden infusion because she coats my throat right so she's really handy if you're like a singer or you have to talk a lot or you just have like horse issues i don't mean like you sound like a horse but i mean like your voice is hoarse. you know she's really good for that um okay next up is oat straw and again all these herbs i'm talking about are the common ones but there's a lot of other ones you can use and there's some that you would use every day there are some that are more like symptom specific the ones i'm talking about first are the ones that are usually in people's rotation of what they're drinking in a week um and they just really help get our body like up and running naturally and support lots of nutrition and medicinal properties and things like that um so this is oat straw now oat straw is fantastic as a nervine she's not as strong in the way of like if you were taking a milky oats tincture which is the immature seed head of the oat um, but she is still really good for supporting our nervous system for stress. She's also really good at lifting a low mood and that's because she's loaded with vitamin B's and do not to fall down too much of a rabbit hole, but like she helps us with stress in that way because vitamin B's are crucial to methylation and methylation is what res removes cortisol from your bloodstream and cortisol is a stress hormone. When you are losing your shit, <laughs> you have cortisol pumping through your veins like crazy. And if you don't have enough vitamin B in your body, um, complexes, not just like one vitamin B, but all the vitamin B's that are in oat straw, um, it's really hard for you to calm down. When people are like, just calm down, just take a breath. You're like, I'm losing my shit <laughs> because I have so much cortisol pumping through my bloodstream right now, you know? So that is oat straw infusion. And she's a fantastic one. I, I really like her. She's, I'm a, a highly wired person. <laughs> Um, and so and I'm always in my head. So she really just helps my body like cope with that level of stress. I also have the, um, the, the MTHFR genetic mutation, which means that um, I don't really process vitamin B well. So all the natural vitamin B I can get the better. Um, okay, next up is, oh, here she is. Next up is comfrey, big bad comfrey. A lot of people are afraid of comfrey because Way back in the day, um, some people were using like, even though they used it for years and years and years and years without any problem, when they started like getting into like the heroic healer type stuff, you know, where like people came and took all of like wisdom from various indigenous people and then they hurt themselves with it because they didn't know what they were doing. They're like, she's dangerous. So Comfrey does have some alkaloids in her that can be problematic to our liver if you drink her in excess amounts. Um, however, one really cool thing happened way back in the day, well, like in the 60s or 50s. Uh, someone's going to check me on that. Um, this guy created hybrid comfrey with the idea of making it an edible livestock food because it grows so big, right? Uh, well, wild country is comfrey is a really small plant. So this hybrid variety had little to no alkaloids in her leaves after blooming, which is really fantastic. And that makes her safe for internal use. And what's really fantastic is there's a lot of studies on it for livestock because, you know, it can hurt animals too if it had those alkaloids in it. Now, a lot of people say, 
but I can't find the Russian variety. Everything's a fish and Alice. Everything's a fish and Alice. Everything's this. Everything's that. Actually, these companies are just mislabeling it because nobody is growing in bulk this little two foot um, tall wild plant that doesn't produce a whole lot of stem compared to the hybrid variety that gets to about I don't know six seven feet tall and you can just keep harvesting again and again and again she's vigorous so comfrey comfrey is called knit bone for a reason if you've got all kinds of bone isti- issues like osteoporosis a broken bone a fractured bone hip things going on surgeries you're trying to recover from she has alkaloids in her not negative ones that will literally help your bones knit back together in fact she's so efficient at healing wounds internally are what well, externally too like if you get a bad cut and you put comfrey on it before it's had any chance to like heal from the inside out, it can heal so fast from the top down that it traps bacteria and it's problematic. Comfrey is amazing. She's fantastic for anybody who's trying to heal gut issues, bone issues, calcium depleted issues. She is one that I really like always encourage people to get over their fear of using. And you're not gonna be drinking her every day. You're gonna be in a rotation. Just drinking a quart a week is really fantastic for your health. Everyone wanna know how I have such long fingernails and fantastic skin and hair that is literally dragging on the floor when I take it down. It's because I drink nourishing herbal infusions on top of like healthy animal fats and things like that. But also Comfrey is in that rotation and Comfrey builds bone. She is amazing. Um, Okay. So now we're going to jump on. Oh, <laughs> that would have been some shit if I just like fell and slammed my head on the counter uh, because the pillow slipped out from underneath of me. Okay, I'm going to get back up here. This was not the best like chair choice. Well, I have other chairs, but this counter is like freakishly tall. Like whoever installed it, it's like easily five inches taller than the average kitchen counter, which is hard for my short ass to like need bread on or like sit in a chair with. <laughs> you got to be on these really tall stools that are also hard for me to get on. So now we're going to move on to um, the less common, but still really good to use herbs. Um, okay, so one thing that a lot of people did try to use infusions for often was raspberry leaf. Raspberry leaf, as you know, is fantastic for supporting womb health. Anybody who's like bleeding really heavily, or if you're trying to ripen your cervix to give birth, um, you know, or you're just even trying to increase fertility. Oh, hey, Kent, grab me out some uh, red clover, because that's one we forgot. Put it in a jar for me, please. Talking to my other half. Uh, I was thinking about fertility and I forgot about red clover. Um, so raspberry is fantastic for that. However, she has a lot of tannins in her leaf. Now, um, tannins, think about like, um, oh, there goes my board. Think about tannins, like they make your mouth pucker. So like lemons have ascorbic acid in them, but they also have tannins in them. It's fine. I'm, I'm good. Um, and so you really want to make sure that you're not drinking too many tannins because a lot of tannins, while a small amount can help you stop going to the bathroom, help you stop vomiting. However, if you drink a lot of tannins, you will vomit. (laughs) And so raspberry is one of those things that people typically have a bad experience with that they don't really look around for what they're doing when they're making a nourishing or infusion. Um, and so basically you're going to want to not let the raspberry one steep for longer than like four hours anything past that and her tannins really build up in that water and can cause you to feel kind of queasy however before then she's really great for if you are nauseated or if you have diarrhea because these tannins dry things up right even if you've got like a wet fever or a runny nose tannins dry things up um and so that is raspberry leaf um i forgot but i was okay i'm just gonna have to go at the end and go over specific herbs and and, um how we would infuse them because i forgot with the other two that i was talking about and i see it now but i won't go there Um, but i'll get to it at the end um the next one thank you my dear is red clover now red clover is actually a common one i just forgot her and this is some this is some uh really nasty looking red clover (laughs) 
I think I, I ordered some from a, a source a while back and I opened it up and I was like, oh, that looks like the weed I used to buy when I was like 13 and had more seeds and stems than anything else in it. So I've not used it, but it's one that I get found real fast. Now, typically red clover has nice little blooms and it's really pretty looking, um, but red clover is a really good one. She's a natural blood thinner, which means she's good for reducing fevers and she's good for heart health because the thinner your blood, the easier it is for your heart to pump it. So it takes um, stress off of your cardiovascular system. She's fantastic for hormonal support. Um, but because she is a blood thinner, she's not one that you want to drink for more than three days in a row. But the good news is infusion only lasts three days in the fridge and then you'll go on to your next one in the cycle. So red clover is a fantastic one. Um, okay, so next up is cleavers. Now this one isn't as commonly used as she should be, honestly. Cleavers is really amazing for supporting your natural lymphatic system. Now, uh, your lymphatic system is like the super highway for your immune system, right? It's how the white blood cells get all over. It's how they communicate information. If there's like an invader, if like a virus is trying to get in, they talk about what's going on and they cause your immune response, right? So when you think of lymphatic, you know, when you get sick, you like you have like these glands swell up right here or maybe under your armpits somewhere like that and it's sore and tender to the touch those are just a few out of hundreds of lymphatic glands all over your body and when they swell up there's typically a virus in there or bacteria or they're stagnant something stuck in there it could be free radicals things like that cleavers um, really gets the system up and running she really gets it pushed out she's not like um She's not aggressive about it like something like poke would be, and I would not make a poke root infusion. Please don't even put that idea in your mind. You will really hurt yourself. <laughs> but cleavers is not that way. She's fantastic. She's gentle. She's traditionally um, all over Europe. She was a stew herb, which means like um, – you would take her and throw her in your pot of stew. She's fantastic. Um, and she is pretty tasty edible. You can't eat her when she's raw because she wants to stick to everything. They call her bed straw, goose straw, sticks all over things in the garden. She's not sticky. She's got these little clingy hairs that grabs on anything. And if you tried to eat that <laughs> while it was raw, it would get stuck in your throat, scratch you at least, but cooked, she's pretty good. Um, and then as an infusion, she's just fantastic for supporting lymphatic flow, but she's also a natural diuretic, which meaning, which means she's really good for water retention if you need to get some water off but also supporting your kidneys making you pee more often which makes her good for um keeping like kidney stones at bay or keeping kidney stones out in general um so next up is chickweed she's another food most of the things i'm talking about here are food have you noticed that you might not think of it because we don't really like maybe eat all these wild foods anymore like we should but raspberries of food um uh, comfrey is kind of a food they made it for livestock um red clover is definitely a food you can eat her blooms um she makes delicious like um jelly or like puddings and stuff like that cleavers is a food and chickweed is a food chickweed is one of those plants when most people get into like wild crafting herbs for the first time for food that they grab onto because she's easy to identify she's tasty she just kind of just tastes like lettuce honestly but you can make her into pesto and all kinds of things all kinds of things <laughs> as a nourishing herbal infusion she is fantastic for cooling our bodies down she's a really cooling lady think about the season that she grows in early spring she likes to cool our whole system down she's really anti-inflammatory as well she's good for fever she's good for um, helping you burn fat I have to be careful that I don't drink her too much. Um, I, I know people are like, oh, so it must be so amazing to be skinny. I'm like, hey, it's actually, I have a really like out of control metabolism. <laughs> and so I have to like make real effort to keep weight on. Like I lose it really easy. It's, you know, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't situation. But um, cleavers is fantastic because she's got natural saponification properties, which means um, think about soap. When you grab, like you have like a really greasy covered dish and you grab your dish soap. And you wouldn't be able to just rinse that grease off with water, right? It'd still be there and I'll film. But when you put soap on it and it just scrubs away, what's happening is saponification. Basically, the soap is going into the cellular structure of the fat and busting it open, allowing it to wash away, right? Well, chickweed has that same property. And that means that she can not only help us reduce the fat in our body, she really can. She is also really fantastic, fantastic, fantastic 
for helping us get more nutrition out of our food because that saponification process is basically breaking down these cellular structures that we're after. Remember how I talked about having to break down the cellular structure in the plant material to get it out? Well, she in then turn goes into your body and breaks down the cellular structure of the food that you've eaten. So you get more minerals and nutritional nutrition from the food that you eat. But she's also a really amazing ally for anybody who suffers from ovarian cysts. Seriously, if you have ovarian cysts, you need to be having chickweed in your life all day, every day. I'd even argue that it's an infusion that I would drink every day alongside the other infusions. It takes time, but she can reduce and outright remove cysts. The first time I discovered that I had an ovarian cyst, was when it ruptured. <laughs> and then, <laughs> excuse me, I discovered that doctors don't do shit about ruptured ovarian cysts. You know, it was horrible. It was horrible. And I was like, I'm never going through that again. They didn't see more than there was one more cyst. There was one more cyst and it was rather large. And they were like, well, we could go in and surgery and this and this and that. And I'm like, I'm just going to try to chickweed. And so I told my OBGYN, I said, and give me six months and I'll be back and we'll see if that cyst is still there. In six, men, in six months of drinking chickweed infusion every day, using chickweed tincture every day, using chickweed infused castor oil packs on my abdomen, uh, that cyst was gone. And I, as far as I know, I haven't had one since and I keep her in the rotation. So she is really, really fantastic um, ally to have in our life. Even if you don't have the ability to have ovarian cysts, you should still use her because she's really good at, you know, the inflammation and helping with gut health and, and just cooling off hot bodies if you have a really hot constitute. Um, okay, next up is Hawthorne. So Hawthorne is a little berry in the apple family and she is amazing for all things cardiovascular health. Anything you're like, huh, I have this situation going on with my heart or my arteries or this or my valve. I wonder if Hawthorne would be good for that. The answer is yes. Hawthorne, Hawthorne, Hawthorne is amazing. I don't care if it's high cholesterol, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, you know, um, anything like that. If you've got artery issues, if you want, you know, to just help extend your life. Hawthorne is fantastic. If you're somebody that has like heart disease in your family, or if you're just a woman, you know, and you have higher risk for heart disease, you really, really, really should have Hawthorne in your life. And don't wait till you're older. I mean, if you're older, just get on it now. But I mean, like when you're younger, start now. What you do now affects your health when you're 40, 50, 60. You know, how you treat your bodies in your, you know, all of your life, but especially in your 20 and your 20s and your 30s is really a correlation of how you're going to be doing in your 50s and your 60s. Um, and now you notice I have two different jars here. This one's got dried hawthorn berries and this one has dried hawthorn um, leaf and bloom. Now, the thing about Hawthorne is that when it's a berry, you can make an infusion out of it, but it's not going to be very strong. And so if you're going to use um, a Hawthorne berry, the berry, you need to make sure it's two ounces per quart. And I want you to boil it like gently for like 20, 30 minutes and then pour it into your quart jar because the water needs extra help breaking down the cellular structure of the berry because berries are tougher in the way that um, they're meant to hold on nutrition for the sake of feeding a seed, right? It's like a little womb and you've really got to break it open to get the nutrition out of it. Now, the really neat thing about the Hawthorne leaf and bloom that you can buy is that it's cheaper than the berries. And there's lots of little studies that say the, um, the leaf and the bloom have the same, if not more at times of the medicinal properties that we're after than the berries do. And this one is just one ounce per quart and just like the infusion you watched me make earlier. And she's fantastic. And you can also, you know, this is a food. It's an apple. Can I use Hawthorne? Can you eat apples? They're little, they're literally a little apple and people make like um, jelly out of them all the time. People make ketchup. You can make Hawthorne berry ketchup. I mean, it's just a thing that people do. You can make all kinds of foods that I've heard. These are foods. Most of these are foods. Foods. Um, speaking of food, and all my jars are piling up over here. Uh, okay, speaking of foods, how about seaweed? <laughs> this is dulse. There's all different types of seaweed. You could use like bladder rack. Uh, you could probably use um, kombu, general seaweeds that are, are considered um, edible. And now these are fantastic for iodine. 
iodine, unless you're eating refined, like horrible for you table salt all the time, you need a good source of iodine. Now there's a lot of iodine in dairy, even in grass fed, because typically um, dairies are using iodine to wash the cow's udders off before they milk and the iodine by proxy gets into the cheese and then it gets into you. Iodine is a good thing. Iodine um, is really important for thyroid health. And there's a lot of people out there and a lot of studies that believe that most people that have thyroid symptoms are usually actually pretty deficient in iodine. I mean, it's at least a factor in it. You know, there's a lot of things that can contribute to it. But I drink um, a seaweed infusion about once a week. I make once a week and it, it is going to taste like you're drinking the ocean and it is going to be kind of salty. But also don't be afraid of salt. Real salt, real mineral based salt is literally how your neurons in your brain fire. It is how your body functions. You need sodium in your body, but you don't need nasty refined bleached dead refined table salt you need like fantastic like sea salt minerals and like celtic gray salt and like what you get out of seaweed and a lot of people have a fear of like radiation and stuff and seaweed but it's kind of an oxymoron because seaweed is packed with iodine which is actually a type of radiation it's there well i should say radiation is a type of iodine it's a dangerous type of iodine this is a positive type of iodine that if you have enough iodine in your body like during like chernobyl or something like that you have to take iodine tablets to protect yourself because you need enough iodine in your thyroid to prevent damage right um so even I'd argue if you were going through cancer radiation treatment, um, consider looking into having seaweed in your diet because she can really help prevent further damage than you're already doing and trying to save yourself, um, which I'm not judging anybody on that. We all have our own path to walk with that. Um, but Dulce is one of my favorites. I cook with her in general, but I, I really, really like her for supporting my general thyroid health and the salt that I need in my diet and just all around like helping my body. So that's a seaweed one. Uh, okay. Yeah, you could. Uh, oh, I'm not letting myself answer questions until the end because I, but I'm almost to the end. I'm almost to the end. We're getting there. Maybe like 20 more minutes of me jabbering and then I'm doing the Q&A, okay? Um, that's why I, I forgot to say. That's why I lost myself there. The reason you don't have to worry about seaweed having radiation in her is because she already has her own iodine. Like uh, the, the radioactive iodine that can hurt us doesn't have room to get into her because she has the positive iodine that's taking up space. So she literally has no room to absorb radiation because she is her own type of iodine. Okay, so um, next up, roots. Now this happens to be dandelion root, but I'm just gonna talk about roots in general. Um, Okay, so roots can be made into infusions. The same rule needs to apply in the way that, like, if it is a root that is very fragrant, like, let's just say balsam root. A lot of you might not know what balsam root is, but she smells like a Christmas tree, like balsam, right? Um, you would not want to make a nourishing herbal infusion out of that because, again, the high VOC content. You don't want to be extracting too many of those oils. However, if it's something like dandelion or burdock or even echinacea, you can definitely make a nourishing herbal infusion out of these because they don't have a very strong smell. However, much like the hawthorn berries, um, they have a really tough cellular structure because the root, think of it this way, the root is the root cellar of the plant. It's where she stores all of her nutrients and minerals and salts and sugars and starches to get her through the winter, right? She's building this up She's building this up all season long, which is why it's kind of moot point to dig her in the spring because it's like empty. You want to dig her in the fall when she's like spent all season filling herself back up, right? But she's meant, she's engineered herself to hold on to these properties. So if you're going to make a root infusion, it's still one ounce per one quart of boiling water, but you need to simmer it. Simmer it for, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so, 30 minutes or whatever, um, a good amount. And then you might have to add back a little bit of water so you don't, you know, lose out, but then pour it into your jar and let it infuse that way you're just giving more of a chance for that cellular structure to be pre-broken down before the infusion process happens and remember as the water cools that is what is extracting all of the, the nutrients and the minerals uh, okay 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 so common questions that i get is nettle going to sting me if I make a nettle? Infusion? Right, because nettle in the wild, when she's fresh, you touch her wrong and she'll sting your ass. <laughs> she doesn't actually sting you. She has a type of hydrocolic acid. I probably said that wrong. She basically throws like histamines at you. 
she throws a type of histamine at you of a little of a little stem and when that hits you it burns it causes an allergic reaction she's like literally making you have an allergic reaction however ironically she's really good for allergies but when she's dried or cooked um let me find that when she's dried or cooked um those little histamines go away i mean they go away in the way that they're inert and they're not going to be able to sting you so you're not going to sting yourself working with dried um nettle infusion um so people ask me can i add a little bit of a, like a little bit of mint or something well you could uh, a sprig like a sprig like a leaf but i would really consider instead like okay so for example um oat straw tastes really good with chamomile and rose it's one of my favorite like tea blends however what i typically do is i'll make a chamomile rose tea i'll brew up a little batch of tea and then i'll have my nourishing herbal infusion and then i blend them together right blend them together when you're done that way you're not brewing your your um your herbs that have like a lot of volatile oils and that can't be used as nourishing herbal infusion for too long and then you have your nourishing herbal infusion and you blend them together and there's no harm no foul now um that brings me to um a lot of people want to like let's say you want to make a linden and oat straw infusion um i would consider um, making them separately and then adding them resist the urge to say i will make a bunch of um infusions blended together at once because you kind of miss out on the the potency of it right like you could say okay i'll put an ounce of linden and an ounce of oat straw into a half gallon jar if you did that i suppose you wouldn't really lose a lot of the extraction value because there'd be an ounce of each but honestly, I've always found it to be um, more potent. I don't mean potent and like, yeah, stronger, but like more healing to our body. If we would make the oat straw infusion and the linen infusion, let them be who they are and then blend them together. But I would also urge getting to know each one of these infusions. They are going to have reactions on your body. Some people, if you drink too much nettle too fast, your, your body is not accustomed to that level of minerals and you might like end up feeling kind of jittery. Um, and you might just kind of like, oh, and you could have an anxiety attack. I know that sounds scary. I don't want to scare you guys off. But the trick to not having that happen is don't make a quart jar for the very first time and then pound a quart in a day. <laughs> like drink a half a cup and see how you feel. The next day, drink another half a cup. If you're on to day three and that half a cup didn't bother you and you've probably got about a cup left, you can probably drink the whole cup, right? Wean yourself onto it. That's also why you wouldn't want to drink, let's say, if you've never used any of these infusions before, let's say raspberry is the culprit that made you vomit because you let it sit too long. But you also drink a linden and an oat straw. You drink them all on the same day and you puked. Or you felt really awesome. The point is, you don't know which one of these infusions made you feel good or made you feel bad because you used them all at the same time. And that's why we want to rotate through them, get to know one plant at a time, see how they react in our body, see how we feel before we start having to play the guessing game. Because if it was a bad reaction and you puked from drinking too much raspberry infusion or something sat too long, are you really going to trust yourself to try the linden and ostra because you can't trust them? <laughs> you don't know which one actually made you feel that way versus if you had just drinking raspberry and like later that day you puked. It's likely because you let it sit too long, but then you know that it was raspberry. You know that the linden and the oat straw didn't do that to you, right? Okay, so let's see. Now I want to talk about making a cycle, right? Because it seems overwhelming. It seems overwhelming. I hear that from people a lot. They just don't know where to start. They don't know which herbs are which, and, and they just, ugh, right? Okay, so let me take a drink here. Generally, start with, you can start with seven. Let's just say, well, let's just do five. Let's do five. Let's say oat straw. Let's do all the common ones. Linden, comfrey, uh, red clover, and where are you at and then that's five right line up this way so you see all five kind of right okay let me get back up on my stool <laughs> um okay so here's five herbs right what you can do is you can write down on it doesn't you don't have to go buy labels you can use a piece of painter's tape or duct tape you can write on the lids with a sharpie you don't have to go spend extra money to do this but what i usually do when i'm trying to get um somebody into nourishing herbal infusions they need to be on a cycle and they don't want to be overwhelmed i say okay here's five jars 
Today, you'll choose to drink nettle if you want. It can be any, there's no particular um, like cycle that you have to drink these in. It could be any five. On day one, you sit down on designated day, let's say Sunday. Sunday's a good day, right? So on Sunday, we're going to put an ounce of each herb into each jar. Uh, we're going to do, well, actually, we're going to write some stuff in the label. We're going to do an ounce of red clover. We're going to do an ounce of comfrey. We're going to do a half an ounce of linden. We're going to do an ounce of oat straw, and we're going to do an ounce of nettle, right? And then what happens is we say on our labels here, we write down. So we know with linden, it's only a half ounce per quart, right? Because she's a little bit stronger. It won't kill you if you use an ounce per quart, but typically people don't like to drink it after it's that strong. So a half ounce is good. Um, so we write down that it's only a half ounce per quart, right? And then we could write on here, can rebrew. Meaning after you make that infusion, you can make a second infusion with the same plant matter but you have that information written on the label so you don't have to try to store it in your brain or feel overwhelmed about it right so then you get your boiling water on sunday and you make yourself an infusion right the next day at the same time that you're straining your infusion you pour boiling water over the next one right you get what i'm saying here so when you get back to sunday it would actually probably be tuesday because you could rebrew some of these like if you have one that you rebrew just add that into your cycle it's just one more day of infusion that you have right and then but whenever you get to the day that you all of your jars are empty you sit down you take like 20 minutes probably 15 even if that if you don't got if you don't have young kids you can get it done 10. <laughs> um and you fill up your jars again and then all you have to do for the rest of the week is strain one, fill one, strain one, fill one, strain one, fill one. And you can make whatever cycle you want. Oh, I almost forgot about one. I just, it's like she called out to me. She's like, you forgot to talk about me. I'll get to her. So like, let's say you've got the yuck that's going around right now, or you're trying to like support your lung health. Maybe on Sunday, you start with a mullein infusion, a mullein leaf infusion. And you're making sure that after you strain her, that you use a really fine, um, like like a, a cloth because you don't want little hairs to irritate your lungs, right? You strain her really well. Remember, strain mullein really well. So you start with your mullein and you have, you drink mullein on Monday, you finish it off probably on Tuesday, but then by then you started your red clover one, right? And she's ready to strain. And so you pour boiling water over the next one and you have one that you're finishing up drinking, right? You get into the cycle. You get into the cycle of, um, constantly having one ready and, and constantly having one made however you're cutting out that part where you have to stop to weigh out your herbs and i know that sounds funny but as humans were or doesn't like it saves that much time but really it does because what happens is you already have these things lined up right like anybody who meal plans knows that you're more likely to eat when you get home off of work or something like that if all you have to do is pop something in the oven from the freezer or pull out wherever you've saved in your fridge that you're going to be eating versus having to cook it, right? So think of this as like nourishing herbal infusion meal planning and the way that you're going to pre-fill your jars for the next week to come. And then you know what you're going through and you can switch them out. You can say, well, I've got, you know, a nasty cold. So mullein's going to be in there. And then maybe I want to support my, you know, my, uh, my immune system. So I'm going to add some cleavers in there to help you know get my lymphatics i'm feeling kind of sluggy you know um sluggish and that'll happen in the spring we feel kind of down and gross you know we need to get our lymphatic system up and running and i've been pretty fucking stressed out lately so i'm gonna add an oat straw you know and you can pick there's no like set rules that of every herb that you have to use after each other or in the day of or anything like that just keep cycling through them right and you can even be like i really i really like flourish on nettle or like cleavers makes me feel really good. So I'm gonna add her in maybe two times in the week. You could even do three times if you really want to. You know, you could do four times with anything except for red clover. <laughs> um, so that brings me to just jabbering a little about uh, what plants might have um, limitations or what ones might need rebrew. And it's actually pretty simple. Um, if something is slimy, <laughs> if something is supposed to have like um, like mucosal properties, like it's supposed to like, you know, coat, like um, pull down inflammation, help your digestive tract. Typically it needs to be infused twice. It's fine to drink it the first time you need that, but then reinfuse it. So like, uh, where'd you go? 
Oh, so comfrey is one that we want to re, um, reinfuse for a second time. And remember, all that means is after you strain your herb out, instead of throwing it in your compost pile or feeding it to your chickens or putting it on a tree or in your trash or whatever you do with your food scraps, you're going to follow the same process again and just rebrew it a second time. And so you get a half gallon out of one ounce, basically, if you do it that way. Um, if you're only using a quart jar, you can make it twice, which ends up with a half gallon. Um, and then let's see, remember for raspberry leaf, you don't want to let it go for more than four hours. I'd even say three would be fine because she has a lot of high tannins in her, which can make some people puke. <laughs> um, but before then she's perfectly fine. And even then she won't kill you. It's just, your body's like, nope, don't want these tannins. <laughs> and then you feel better. It's not like a consistent vomiting thing. It's just going to puke it out. Um, okay. So for mullein, it's really important that if you make a mullein infusion, you need to be mindful that you are um, straining her through a tightly woven cloth. I really like the nut milk bags for that because it's a really fine micron. Mullen has little hairs on her that are irritating to your lungs and your digestive tract. But ironically, when you remove those hairs, the infusion is fantastic for lung health and, and just all around immune support. So just make sure that you um, strain her really well. Um, and then with Linden, she's one that we only use a half ounce per quart and we can rebrew her. And so rebrewing is easy and she actually goes further because you're only using a half ounce per quart. Um, so out of a half ounce, you get a half gallon of infusion out of her. Um, and then remember with roots, you've got to simmer those a while before you make the infusion to break it down. Um, same with berries. So now let's jabber just for a split second about what I um, add to my infusion sometimes. I know I talked about adding teas that we like, but um, I got sidetracked, so there's a few more options, and then we'll do Q&A. After that, I will have pretty much covered everything. So these are foods. Nourishing herbal infusions are foods. It's not like people are always like, how much dose should I take? These aren't pharmaceuticals. I would argue that no herbs are pharmaceuticals. Your individual body will react differently. They've not had big FDA trials to see how they act on every single person. And they're not really meant to. They, they just kind of act individually in your own body. But typically, I'm like, I don't know. I pour a cup and drink it <laughs> because it's a food, right? Like you wouldn't say, how much apple juice am I supposed to take in a dose, right? Don't think of these as medicine. Think of them as food that nourishes your body deeply. That's the idea behind nourishing herbal infusions, right? So think of them more like a food and less like something like some medicine. Uh, okay, so with that in mind, that means sometimes we can add food to our food, right? Be a real weird world. <laughs> it would be a real weird world if we had to like only eat one food at a time. If you're like, Oh, well, you might like onions and things, but you're only allowed to just eat onion. I don't care if you want to add it to a pot roast or something else. You can only eat onion <laughs> and while you're eating onion. If you want an orange, you can't or whatever. You know, you can't blend things together. I like to blend things together um, when they have um, the taste good or even if they have like similar healing properties. So, again, linden is really good for anti-inflammatory, right? So is black cherry juice, black cherry juice, not tart, cherry, not tart cherry juice, not normal cherry juice. Black cherry juice is fantastic as an anti-inflammatory. There's a few studies that show her more effective than are just as effective as ibuprofen. And um, I have self-induced scoliosis in my neck from, you know, when I was a homeless teenager, my, you know, all of my childhood, basically. Um, I carried a pack that was far too heavy and it fucked my neck up and it hurts sometimes. Um, and so usually when I'm doing computer work, you know, I'm like hunched over, <laughs> like a little gremlin. Uh, but um, so what I do is I take my linden and I add me a little bit of cherry juice. It's fantastic. So now it tastes good. And Linda tastes good anyway. She kind of tastes like sunshine. I don't know how to explain it. Like blooms in the summer. Um, because, you know, blooms. Um, but I add cherry juice to her. And now I'm drinking juice. But I'm also really like doubling down on the anti-inflammatory properties of what I'm drinking. Right? They join each other. Right? So how about, for an example... Ooh, it's still pretty hot. When this comfrey infusion is cooled down and ready to be um, strained tomorrow, um, because, okay, so a little bit of backstory. Uh, my son had severe non-typical presenting SIBO. 
took us like three years to figure out what's going on. It wasn't, I mean, it was bad. He lost a lot of weight, no matter what we tried. We went to specialists, like children's hospital specialists, like traveled a long way, couldn't figure out what it was. We finally figured out with Sybil, I took care of it in about a week. It was ridiculous. But the, as long as some of you may know who have had SIBO, it's not just about killing off the bacteria. It causes all kinds of ramifications through your digestive tract, leaky gut syndrome and stuff like that. So he has gained back about 25 pounds and it was bad. It was a bad situation. Um, and it wasn't just because we killed the SIBO and we eat lots of um, healthy animal fats. It's because comfrey infusion mixed with collagen so think about how these two things go together collagen is really important for digestive health for um really strong mucous membranes for every joint in your body for you know skin looking great for hair growing well collagen is a really 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 important thing to have in our diet and comfrey also really really helps repair um so the structure of things and like digestive tract health and things like that so i make my comfrey infusion i strain it it's cold and then i take a scoop of my collagen powder however much yours tells you to use and this one is from grass-fed grass-fed um, cows you don't when you want to make sure that you know the source of where it's coming from um and then i mix it together and he drinks it uh within about a month of drinking that on a regular basis he started to gain weight and all of his leaky gut syndrome symptoms disappeared i mean his brain was clear again thoughts were clear again he was not having stomach aches anymore in the way that like when you have leaky gut syndrome you can't really digest your food well so it just goes through you right so you're going to the bathroom all the time that stopped in about a month uh, and we keep him on top of it now we're more on maintenance so he's only drinking about a quart of comfrey infusion a week and then he takes um the collagen powder every day and a little bit of water but also we add it to the comfrey so you can um you can really think about how like this food would interact with that food and would they complement each other or would one fill in the gap of something that something else isn't doing, you know? So again, I want you to think of these as food. I want you to think of these as nourishing, healing foods. And we combine foods together a lot, right? That's really hot. <laughs> I'm not just gently resting my hand on like this 97 degree or a hotter thing. Um, okay. So I think I've answered just about, okay, let me push all this stuff out of the way and then i'm going to jump into the q a session and it's going to be a little interesting because i'm again i'm looking at two different screens this screen over here the you is the one that's facebook and youtube and this one is instagram so i kind of I'll, I'll hop back and forth and I'll, I'll answer a handful of your of your questions on each and then i think that'll do it but i'm pretty sure i covered most things okay so i'm gonna try to no i can't pull it closer so i'm just gonna have to well, i might move you this way just so i can see the screen a little better and i don't have to lean on the corner and like impale myself okay so i'm gonna come and go over to the comment section okay so okay so somebody asked the question okay they didn't actually ask this question but you're going to see this uh, the question pop up on the youtube and facebook one they said jennifer i heard her say on another video honey will make nettle taste bad salt or miso is recommended she's absolutely right um a lot of people when they're just waiting for their taste buds to become accustomed to the flavor of nettle your mind naturally wants to sweeten something but uh, don't sweeten it <laughs> Don't sweeten it. Consider adding a little bit of salt or some miso to it. It takes better to savory things than it does um, sweet things because it's naturally a savory plant. It would be like if you boiled up some broccoli and you're like, maybe honey would make this taste better. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I'm not saying there isn't some type of fucking recipe out there that uses honey with broccoli, but typically you're going to be like, hey, it would probably taste better with some butter, maybe some garlic, some salt, you know, um, just think of it as a savory food. So, um, is this safe with SEAC tea? You know, they're a food, so it probably won't interact with anything that's in the SEAC. SEAC is pretty strong stuff. Uh, I would be more concerned. I'm not telling anybody to not use SEAC tea. I would be more concerned about the long-term ramifications potentially of SEAC tea compared to nourishing herbal infusions alongside of it. Um, SEAC tea isn't bad. It's just, you know, it's a, it's a rough treatment. It's just, it's a rough treatment for cancer. Um, sometimes, I mean, it's not rough compared to like chemotherapy and stuff, but you know, um, okay. So, so 
On Instagram, somebody asked, I take nettle tincture daily for allergies. Should I skip the infusion? No. Tinctures are fantastic. Uh, a nettle tincture is, is good for allergies, but I would argue that she's going to be targeting your thyroid more than the nettle infusion will. But it's also important to remember that tinctures have no nutritional value to them. And people are like, oh, tinctures extract minerals and nutrients. I'm like, yeah, but you're taking it at like five or 10 drops at a time. It would be like saying I ate a quarter of a piece of a carrot and now I've got enough vitamin A in my body. <laughs> so tinctures are really good, a really good tool to use, but they do not replace the nourishment that you would get from a, a nourishing herbal infusion. And with nettle, uh, most people see more allergy relief if they're using the infusion. You can use it alongside the um, the uh, tincture as well. Um, somebody asked if you could make a rohibose infusion. You know, I was thinking about that the other day. I guess um, she is and isn't fragrant. If I did that because she does kind of have a smell to her, she's not quite something like chamomile or lavender, but I would probably cut it down to a half an ounce per quart. Um, and I would probably say the thing about, say the same thing about green tea. Although with green tea, it'll probably taste bitter pretty bitter if you let it brew that long because a typical steeping for green tea is like what like four minutes five minutes so um you can play around with it and see what happens and see how your body likes it uh, okay so somebody over here on instagram asked is infusion tea better to drink hot or cold so um infusions are better to drink however you prefer them <laughs> i like them cold honestly like i love making myself some wind and lemonade um, in the summertime or like a really cold glass of nettle like hits the spot for me but some people might want to warm it up and just see how you you individually prefer it because it's a food some people might like cold sandwiches some people might like hot sandwiches okay um let's see some questions um on uh on youtube and facebook <laughs> sorry god my brain's like oh you don't know words right now um so somebody asked, do you sell the herbs so we could make them at our home? I do not sell bulk um, dried herbs. I'm hopeful too in the next couple of years to hold different ballpark with compliance. But um, you can look at places like Frontier Herbal, Star West Botanical, Mountain Rose Herb, San Francisco Herb Company. You can just hop online. Now, if you buy by the pound, you'll need by the pound because you're using ounces at a time. Um, but if you can't afford it, find somebody to go in on it with you be like let's do an herb share like us three people or us two people or us five people we want to start drinking these nourishing herbal infusions but maybe we can't afford the you know upwards of probably 20 bucks max or 25 dollars depending on what you're buying uh for a pound of this herb but if we break it apart we can afford it and order it more often right and we just share um okay so let's see what, uh, okay. So what kind is safe for nursing moms is a question I have on Instagram. Um, most of these are food based. Honestly, I don't know of any of these infusions that would have a negative effect. Um, nettle's kind of drying, but also she's one of the main ones that people suggest for breastfeeding moms, but you just make sure that you're drinking a little bit more water so your milk supply doesn't drop from a little bit of dehydration, but that's just, you know, you don't got to overdo it, just like an extra glass a day. Um, so let's see, let's see another question, people just screaming at me, <laughs> answer this non-related to the video question. Um, let's see, so Okay, the questions, just to put this out there, the questions that I'm answering in this Q&A section of the video are about nourishing herbal infusions. So if you're throwing random medical questions at me, I'm, I'm not gonna answer those right now. Not to be mean. <laughs> I just have to keep on track. Um, so let's see, let me, um, uh, let me, let me see what I can find here. Um, would you drink an infusion in place of a meal? That's a good question. If, if I didn't have the ability to make myself a meal, it would be better that I drink a cup of infusion than nothing. However, there's not a whole lot of calories in this. Some of them have a good amount of protein, but, um, and calcium and things like that, it would definitely be better than nothing. But like, I would also try to eat a meal. However, if you're really sick, or you're just like really nauseated, like, uh, or you have like potentially like an eating disorder where you're like, you're trying to be like, well, um, you're working on it, right? You need some way to get nutrition in your body. But the idea of chewing something or like even keeping something that's like thick down, or you're having like digestive issues that you're trying to work through, um, infusions would be a really good option for, um, 
giving your body some nourishment, but it's easy to digest. Um, okay, so let me scroll here. Let me scroll up to the comment section here on Facebook and YouTube. Um, somebody asked, are oat straw and milky oats the same thing? They are the same plant, a different part. So oat straw is just like it sounds, the straw. It's the part of the plant that grows beneath where the milky oat is produced. And a milky oat is just like, oat grain like oatmeal before it all the it before it uh, matures all the way and it creates this latex for like three days it's a natural nervine that calms you down but it's not present in oatmeal once it's all the way developed um and then the oat straw is the part that we harvest after we've taken the oat tops off so same plant same family different parts it does have similar nervine properties to it i wouldn't say it's as potent as like a milky oat infusion and people are like well i'll just make an infusion out of dried milky oats tops you can but that latex dissipates um basically there's like barely any of those um those really handy latexes left once it's dried but it won't hurt you you can still add tea it's still going to have benefit but it's not quite the same as if you were making um a fresh milky oat tincture um okay so let me scroll up on instagram um so somebody asked it doesn't lose its nutritional properties um once reheated I mean, if you like boiled it to death, but a lot of people um, have the misconception that heat kills nutrition and it can, but usually it's for like vitamin C, like vitamin C is like heat sensitive. There's a few others, but you're really not going to lose much nutrition just by like reheating it back up, you know, but like most people when they're reheating something up, if they want to drink it warm, you're not like bringing it to like a full rolling boil. <laughs> you're like just bringing it, you know, up warm enough that you can drink it warm like a tea. Um, even if you brought it to a boil and then just turned it off, that wouldn't be the same as like the sustaining boil. But even then we could argue that like a soup, let's imagine we're cooking a soup. There's more nutrition in that soup like bone broth you cook that for like 24 plus hours to get all the nutrition out there's definitely more nutrition in that than the soup that you only boiled for like four to five hours and it hasn't been killed off um somebody asked if nettle is bad for your thyroid no nettle is amazing for your thyroid if you have a really overactive thyroid then you should probably stay away from nettle because she nourishes your thyroid function. So if you are like most people and a huge portion of women in this world um, more and more every day and have low thyroid function, nettle is a really good one to use. I might be mindful if you were already on thyroid medication because she might increase your thyroid too much. But you know, you can edge, I would say edge off of some of the thyroid medicine, you know, you can cut your dose versus taking away the nettle infusion, right? like use the thing that nourishes our body and helps our thyroid function. But, but if you don't have thyroids, I mean, cause if you had like a complete, uh, oh God, what's it called? An obliteration. Basically they take your thyroid out and that'll, isn't going to do you any good. You know, it's not going to replace that. Um, but okay. So how about a question from YouTube and Facebook? Um, so let's see. I don't think the class ended. I don't think it kicked me off. I'm right here. Um, so, 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 um, what herb is on your wish of finding this? Not, I'm sorry, that's not related. Uh, let's see, a wild school cap. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> I'm trying to find, um, so somebody asked what kind of root infusions can we make? And I covered this a little bit ago, but just a touch base. You can use any root. Um, I would stick to roots that are considered more in the food or safe to use regularly. But again, if this root has a lot of scent, like a lot of smell, like it's very fragrant, like something like balsam root, or I'm trying to think of any other, my mind is just stuck on balsam root. Um, but any type of root, like valerian, my God, don't make a valerian infusion. <laughs> you wouldn't even be able to drink that. It would just be nasty. But um, just you'd be like, uh, uh. <laughs> but any root that has a really strong smell, fragrance, should not be used as a nourishing herbal infusion. But you can use things like dandelions, uh, burdock, echinacea. I already said that one. There's probably a million other roots that you could use. Um, uh, astragalus is one. Astragalus. Why did I say that wrong? It's astragalus. Um, but she is really fantastic for like a natural blood thinner. But she can be a little bit bitter, so I wouldn't brew for more than a couple hours. But yeah, there's a lot of roots that you can work with. Um, um, somebody asked if I can make a book for you guys, like a dictionary. 
Um, per plant, maybe I, I, I wrote a book a little while back and I'm working on a new one now. That's like a self-guided herbalism course. It's free. You want to pay me for it. Um, well, I mean, if you buy the hard box back, you'd have to pay for it, but you can download the free PDF or the Kindle book is probably how I'll make it. But, um, okay. So let's see. Um, <laughs> so I'm trying to find... So this person, this is a good question on YouTube asks, do you adjust the amount of plant material due to the amount of bitterness, for example, with dandelion root or yellow dock? No, uh, you got to get used to bitter. You, well, you can at first, let me say you can work your way up to it. When I'm making dandelion root tea, well, in a world where we had people over, <laughs> it doesn't really happen anymore. And if they've never had dandelion root tea, I'm not going to brew it till it's nice and black. Right. I'm going to be like, here's some dandelion tea and it's rather weak. And they're like, well, that's tasty and nutty and flavorful versus being like, here's some fucking dandelion tea, like the level that I drink. It would be like the difference of like if somebody's never drinking anything but lattes in their life, if you gave them like the strongest black coffee, they'd be like, oh, <laughs> right, because they're not used to that. So you can do the same thing to yourself. You can start with a small amount of the root and work your way up to that ounce amount. If that ounce amount produces something that is too bitter for your unadapted um, taste buds to handle. And I say unadapted because most people that live on a Western diet or just in Western countries, we've removed most bitter foods from our diet right and so we're like, oh that tastes horrible but traditionally our ancestors everybody's ancestors were eating really bitter things um and it didn't bug them because their taste buds were accustomed to it but you can work your way up and if you make an infusion that you find is just too strong for you to drink you can add more water it's okay to water it down i would rather have you water it down and drink it than not drink it at all right like find ways to get this into your body and i always tell people <laughs> if you don't like the way a particular infusion tastes I bet most of us have drink things that are grosser tasting <clears throat> alcohol <laughs> for worse reasons, right? Like you can handle tasting some like rot gut whiskey or, or whiskey or some piss flavor or water beer, but because you're like, yeah, that'll in inebriate me, right? But I challenge your mindset of, I don't like the way that infusion tastes, but it's going to help your health. And you'll become accustomed to the flavor, right? Like you have to like really ask yourself, I've, I've, I've drinking worse tasting things for worse reasons, right? Uh, okay, so let me jump down to the comments on Instagram and see uh, what was a dandelion root infusion good for? I didn't actually cover that one because I was just talking about roots in general, but that's a good question. Dandelion root is really, really amazing for digestive health, gallbladder function, kidney function, liver function, helping you get more nutrition out of the food you eat. She is also really good for gut health. Anybody who's got heartburn, she is just an amazing ally and she's an easy one to start with dandelion grows everywhere you can roast it yourself but you can also buy the pre-roasted roots i really suggest the pre-roasted roots if you're going to be drinking it that way um i feel like it helps break down the cellular structure more but also she has a really nice nutty taste like almost like coffee good notes of bitter almost a little bit chocolatey even um compared to when she's not roasted um okay so somebody asked about for the dulse infusion, do you use one ounce? Yeah, um, no matter what seaweed you're using, typically I'm using one ounce per quart. Um, okay, so let me scroll down and I'm looking for more questions. Oh, oh, accidentally popped that up. Um, let's see, can they be frozen? They can be, you know, but they're really easy to make. So, I mean, if, you, if you're that deep into meal prep, you could do that if you wanted to make a bunch and then freeze them. But I would say I would rather just like make them and then drink them as I'm going because it, it helps get you more into the rhythm. And like um, even in the ritual of it, as humans, we thrive on ritual. I don't care what the ritual is. I don't care if it's a part of your religion. I don't care if it's part of your morning routine, right? If we set ourselves up with rituals, it gives our animal brain like safety. Like we feel safe. We feel calm. We feel capable. We feel structured right like we don't all have to be like rigidly structured but like it can be a, a ritual that you create making this infusion every day that helps you take your health back into your own hands and just gives you time to like do something to take care of your body but if you absolutely feel like the only way that you can do it is to freeze a bunch that's fine too uh, okay let's see comments on here um 
So this person on Facebook asked, did you say that lemon balm should not be used as an herbal infusion because of its strong smell? Yeah. So again, any plant that has a really strong fragrance, like lemon balm is a really good example. That means she has high volatile organic compounds, VOCs, what the market has deemed as essential oils. And using these internally are dangerous. And so you can use it as a tincture. You can make a normal tea. But when you start making an infusion, you extract way too too many of these VOCs out and it can cause um, damage to your endocrine system, to your gut health, to your organs, to all kinds of stuff. So anything that smells really strong is for tea making. Anything that doesn't have a strong smell is for infusion making. So there's a big difference there. Um, so, okay. So let's see about a question on here. Um, <laughs> How long can you keep plant in the jars and still good to be used? Okay, so if I am doing a rebrew like comfrey and I don't want to drink comfrey the very next day again, I'll pop it in the fridge and I have three days, just like the infusion, just like any food, use it up within three days. Now you can make that infusion at that second rebrew and then you have another three days, right? Because you're taking the plant matter out. However, please be sure to let your jar come up to room temperature or use a different jar because if you pour boiling water into that freezing jar, it's going to explode on you. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, no, yarrow do not, do not make a nourishing herbal infusion out of yarrow. You will really hurt yourself doing that. Yarrow is not. Now you can do that and then dump it in your bathtub. If you're trying to like lower a fever down or use it externally for things, but not internally. No, again, any plant, doesn't matter the type of plant, doesn't matter the plant family or the species of the plant. If the plant has a very strong fragrance, it is not something that you want to use for nourishing herbal infusions. Um, okay, so how long, let's see, let's see. Uh, uh, so somebody asked if I was drinking chickweed herbal infusions every day for six months to shrink the ovarian cysts. I was, I was. Um, I used her every single day. And I only made about a quart jar, sometimes even a pint, because I just needed to make sure that I was drinking a little bit every day. But it was really, really worth it. And that's not just for ovarian cysts, but any cyst, any cysts we have going on. You can even, if you have it in conjunction with like, uh, if you have like a cyst somewhere that they can't remove or something like that, whatever, you want to take care of it yourself, drinking the infusions. And then... When you're done making the infusion, you can take out the plant matter and you can do a poultice, right? So you're working, if it's somewhere on the surface anyway, um, you can work internally and externally with um, chickweed to help cysts. She's pretty amazing. Um, so let's see. Oh, oh. I'm always bumping that up. Um, any nourishing? Oh, no, that's not the same thing. Um, do you drink water on top of the infusions? I only ask because Susan Weed says not to, but I like water too. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would never recommend cutting water out of your diet for any reason. The soda companies also say that that's the same type of hydration. Now you are getting like water in there, but like I, I drink a couple glasses of water every day, but sometimes I don't always want to drink an infusion. I personally, no matter what it is, anything that tells you that you're not like, like you have to do it this way. Like, I know that, that we can say that these things are how we generally do it, but like, if we start limiting something, like it's a problem. I don't like diets or guidance that like try to like, scold us for something that we may or may not be doing in the way of like, like really aggressive like that. So I'll say that like, I'm going to be drinking um, linen infusion most of the day to help my throat. But also I have a glass of water next to my bed every night. And I usually drink that whole glass throughout the night. And then, you know, I wake up and take a drink or whatever. And then in the morning I have a full glass of water. And usually with dinner, I have a glass of water. Like you still need water. <laughs> I mean, they are hydrating, but something like if you drink nothing but nettle, she's kind of a natural diuretic or like cleavers is a diuretic makes you pee more often. Some people can end up dehydrated. So definitely drink normal water alongside of it. Um, that was a good question. Um, okay. So somebody asked, how do you determine when to use half ounce of an herb instead of one ounce for infusions? So for an example, with Lyndon, she, um, where is she at? There you are. Um, nope. Nope. Where is Lyndon? Right in front of my face. Again. She's been hiding today. So Lyndon is like one of those plants that's like in between. And she's in between in the way that like her blooms are kind of fragrant not super fragrant 
but a little bit fragrant. So like if you have an herb that like kind of has a smell to it, not just like it smells like, you know, lettuce has a smell to it if you crush it up and smell it, but like because she's a little bit fragrant, we're going to cut back on the amount we use in the infusion because she has a little bit more VOCs. That way we can scale back. But I don't want you to think, oh, well, then I'll just use way less when I make a lemon balm infusion. <laughs> That's not the way it works. I'm only saying to use um, uh, like a half ounce for herbs that are like a little bit more fragrant because they're just kind of like dance on the edge of having higher volatile oils versus being like, well, this is a really strong plant like peppermint or something. So if I cut back, it'll be okay. But she's got a lot more per. And usually when you buy linden leaf, there's not a whole lot of bloom in there. A lot of people mistake her um, her blooms as leaves and vice versa sometimes. Well, not really vice versa, but you get mainly leaf because they are harvesting these blooms, but it's a lot easier to harvest a lot of linden leaf. Um, okay, so, 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 so. Uh, uh, I'm just going to answer this one just for safety reasons. Um, this person on YouTube asked if lavender brewed with black tea is it safe during pregnancy. No mints. And lavender's in the mint family. Rosemary's in the mint family. Uh, peppermint's in the mint family. You can have small like amounts, very small amounts. But if you start getting into using it on a regular basis, mints um, are a natural, like they cause contractions. Um, they also dry out milk really fast. So be mindful not to be doing that if you plan on breastfeeding, but mints are pretty dangerous during pregnancy. Um, now, not so much the mints like self-heal, and I'm trailing off here, but like something like self-heal who um, is a scentless mint, you can make an infusion out of self-heal drink because she doesn't have those volatile oils. And it's those same volatile oils that she doesn't have that um, won't cause, because she doesn't have them, she won't really cause contractions and things like that. Um, so... Let's see, um, infusions for soup base. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't probably make the whole soup out of an infusion, but sometimes if I have a little bit of leftover infusion, like a half a quart or something like that, I'm like, eh, I'll just dump it in the soup I'm making. Um, particularly with dulse, dulse seaweed or any seaweed that you're working with. I even like, I had that jar of dulse over there because typically what I do when I'm just cooking, if I don't have an infusion, is I just grab a couple pieces out and I throw it in like it's a bay leaf. It actually has a really good flavor. And then unless you add a whole lot, it doesn't really taste like the ocean. But if I have leftover dulse and I'm making something that's like savory and that could take that flavor, I'll add that. But you could also add like nettle or comfrey. Um, chickweed wouldn't be so bad. Cleavers would be okay. Yeah, you can definitely use them up that way. Um... So somebody asked about um, if they're allergic to latex, can they use dandelion? And I'll just answer that one. It really depends on your allergy. Some people who are allergic to latex are only allergic to synthetic. Some people are only allergic to natural. Some people are allergic to both. Um, so it really just depends on you. And if you have the type of latex allergy that reacts on your skin, you could probably do an allergy test patch where you take um, – the infusion and then you put it in on the inner part of your arm or the back of your leg right here and you let it sit for 24 to 48 hours without washing it off and see if anything happens and if you want to test it again do it again and see what happens um or some people take it a little bit further you can take like some gauze and dip it in it and then you can wrap it around your arm so it's constantly on there and wet and typically i'll put saran wrap around it and then the got in the bandage around it to hold it in place or whatever bandana um and let that sit and see what happens if your arm just is wet and you know like waterlogged that's no big deal but if you start getting like rashes and stuff you might be allergic to it um okay so so what do I use for my beautiful and strong fingernails like mine? I drink nourishing herbal infusions every day. I make sure to eat lots of healthy animal fats. I make lots of bone broth, uh, lots of grass-fed meats, things like that. Yeah, I don't live the standard like how people think most herbalists, you know, maybe shouldn't consume animal products and stuff like that. But I'm a really, really big advocate for ethically raised like um, meat sources and things like that. And they can really have an impact on our life and people are like oh what do you use on your skin tallow which is from red meat animals um it's just it's the answer to everything is nourishing and herbal infusions and um the healthy animal fats that i eat i don't have acne and my fingernails break sometimes because i work a lot but they don't break very easy and it just yeah my hair is problematically long at this point <laughs> hits the ground um but yeah okay so let's see somebody asked could you make a mushroom infusion you know 
You could, and I have before, but typically what you're going to want to do is you need to boil it for an hour. <laughs> you got to boil it for an hour and then do the infusion process because typically we need to extract um, some specific properties from these mushrooms that only come from long heat boiled exposure, like exposure. So like if you're making a mushroom tincture, you have to follow the double decoction process where you make the tincture and then you take the mushroom out and you boil the mushroom down and you add some of that water back to your tincture so you have the hot water soluble properties. Um, same thing for the infusion um, in the way that you would need to boil it longer before you then follow the infusion process. Um, okay, let's see. Um, somebody asked if they should stay away from comfrey since they've had hepatitis C, so they're worried about liver damage. Um, you know, it's really up to you because I, I have to make sure that I'm not giving like hardcore medical advice, but like a lot of people feel like comfrey actually helps repair the liver. Um, it's really the problematic alkaloids that are going to be doing damage um, and you're not going to be wanting to drink it every day. She's one of those things that's like once a week in the rotation, right? So you're only drinking a little bit and sometimes um, if you're able to, and some people do um, typically have their liver functions monitored if they've had hepatitis, right? So like you can like start before you get it, fun you know, tested and then you can go in a little later and be like, what's it look like? Is it unhappy or is my liver functions looking better or are they just the same and kind of go from there? Um, so let's see. Um, which ones can be double brewed? So I went over that, but basically, um, Linden and, and Comfrey are your main ones to be rebrewed. Anything that you're using, even if it's something that I didn't mention here, that is kind of in the slimy factor. Like, like, oh, Linden's not slimy when I drink it, but it's, it's thicker, right? It's just a thicker drink. So if you notice that with it, it can typically be rebrewed because that means she's got lots of mucosal properties in her um, that you can probably get more out of if you break down that cellular structure a little bit more with the second brew. Um, okay. Um, let's see, questions down here. So somebody asked, um, when boiling the root first to use um, that water also and just add the rest of the water to the correct measurements or are we just boiling to break down the herb first? Good question. So I would just take my quart of water and then I would boil the herb in that and then I would add that boiled water with the herb into the jar. And if you're missing a little, just add some, you know, really hot tap water or something like that. Just add a little bit more boiling water so you have your full amount because you'll probably um, lose a little when you're boiling off, right? But you can just put it back. Um, okay, let's see. Um, can an ounce even not fit in the quart jar? No, an ounce, an ounce of herb can, these are all, these are just filled. I just filled them up. These aren't weighed out, but yeah, um, an ounce can definitely fit in a quart jar. Um, I've never had an herb, even with the fluffier ones, like um, you might come pretty close to filling with something like red clover or even mullein because they're a little bit fluffier, but just push them down a bit. It'll definitely fit. Um, okay. So let's find another question. Um Okay. Could you make a catnip herbal infusion? No. Again, anything that has a really strong smell or scent to it, and catnip is definitely one of those. And it will like you make another one that would make you vomit because she has a lot of a lot of properties in her that really would upset your digestive tract if you use it in that amount. But again, no potent herbs. If they have really strong smell to them, like a really fragrant, like catnip, again, or chamomile or lavender or mint or anything like that, you cannot use that for nourishing um, herbal infusion. Um, oh, I typed a random word. No, you're still there. Yay, you're still there. It kicked me off of there for a second because I bumped it with my finger. So somebody asked about the, an elderberry infusion. I probably didn't see that question. Yeah, I've used elderberries to make a nursing herbal infusion. She's a berry. Um, she's not as strong as a berry as, as hawthorn, so you probably don't have to um, boil her like you would with the hawthorn berries to break her apart because she's already a really pretty small thing. So you can definitely use um, her for that. Now, typically when I use berries, I do like to use two ounces per quart jar. 
just because you're you're getting more out of her in the way that like a berry is pretty compact right like if i weigh an ounce of there's probably like a there's a pound of elder of uh, hawthorn berries in this right so an ounce is like barely anything so usually i'm doing a couple ounces so um i get a good amount there i'm glad that i got the broadcast back on the youtube and the facebook i was like oh no i i bumped it with my finger and like just exited the situation um i'm using my husband's phone and my phone to do this. I've got, I ordered a tablet so I could do it better for Facebook and YouTube, like just broadcast better. But we are, there's about a foot and a half of snow. We're under a major snow storm outside of me right now. And so ain't nothing was getting delivered in time for anything. So I'm just using these phones. Um, okay. So somebody asked on your rotation, do you drink more than one infusion per day toward the end of the day? Um, you can. Yeah, um, it depends on how much you drink. It depends on if you're sharing. If you've gotten to know that infusion in the past, you know how one makes you feel. You've been drinking that one through the day and you add in this next one. That's fine because, you know, if one makes you feel yucky, it wasn't the one that you've been drinking and feeling fine about. It's the one that you added in. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's fine to finish them off in the same day. Um, somebody asked if I'm going to be saving these videos. Yes, I'm saving it here on my Instagram TV. I'm saving it here on my Facebook wall. I'm saving it on my YouTube. I'm also going to be downloading it from Instagram and then uploading it to YouTube because it saves on my live, but like it doesn't, um, the algorithm doesn't throw the, um, the live recorded videos up for people to see. Right. So I'll re upload it too. So people can see it just as a normal YouTube video. Um, Okay, so let's see these new comments. Um, okay, okay, okay. Um, okay, so looking for questions. Um, these are mainly people. Oh, should you use spring water or distilled water or doesn't matter? I don't suggest anybody use distilled water. Distilled water is dead water. It's literally, it's been distilled. It has no minerals. It has nothing in it. It's really hard for your body to use this water. So um, I would definitely use spring water or filtered tap water. You can even use tap water if that's all you have. It's better than nothing. Um, with tap water, the main issue is fluoride and chlorine being added. Most places don't add fluoride, but they definitely add chlorine. But here's a fun fact. Chlorine evaporates off in about 24 hours. So if you don't want to be drinking chlorinated water because it's really bad for your gut health and you want to use that for your infusion, it also boils off, arguably. So you can either let it sit out for 24 hours or you can let it come up to a boil and let it boil for like three or four minutes and the chlorine will be evaporated off. Um, okay. So let's see questions here. Um, um, is dandelion leaf okay as an infusion? Yeah, the whole entire part of dandelion is edible. I would say even her blooms are okay because you, you've never been like, wow, dandelion blooms smell so amazing. <laughs> they don't smell bad, but they don't really smell like anything, which means they don't have high levels of those VOCs I was warning about, which means that it's safe to make an infusion. Um, okay, so... Um, how about ginger root? Yeah, it's a tea, not an infusion because ginger is spicy, right? So like you might not, well, actually, yeah, ginger has a pretty strong smell, but anything that's really like spicy like that, you know, like definitely don't go making a pepper infusion or like anything like that. And she's best as tea. Um, I make tea and I add ginger juice to my teas all the time. You can add it to your infusion afterwards, but you wouldn't want to be infusing it. Um, okay, let's see any questions. Um, what about using filtered rainwater? If you've filtered enough that it's safe for you to drink, you can definitely use it. Um, if I was going to be filtering rainwater, I would probably be mindful to use something better than like a like a basic kitchen filter. I would probably use something like a Berkey, a Berkey filter. They get out a lot of contamination, including like heavy metal and like um, toxins and bacteria and stuff. They're really, really amazing filters. Um, okay, so... So let's see, um, can you do combinations in the infusion? Um, I did answer this, but I'll answer it again. Um, it's best to make them separately and then add them together. But if you're really, really hell bent on making them together, um, I would do a half gallon jar 
and then do a half an ounce of one or an ounce of one and an ounce of the other. The idea is you need enough of the herb to actually saturate into the water to make a difference. And that's why it's important that we weigh out the herb with a scale so we know we're getting an exact amount. And you would want an ounce of water, I mean, an ounce of herb per quart of water. So you would need to use a half gallon. I suppose you could cut that down into a quart amount, you know, but honestly, you're not really going to be getting enough of any one of them to give your body the nourishment that we're after. So I would either, I would personally make them individually and then combine them or do the half gallon method. So you have enough of each that it matters. Um, okay. So I oh, almost knocked my pee over. Let me see if I can find some new uh, comments or questions on here. Okay. Let me scroll down here. Um, Let's see, looking for, do all these herbs look the same when growing in different parts of the world? Yep, I mean, sometimes they might be bigger or more vigorous in the way that like maybe the soil quality is better or maybe they're just happier where they're at or you get more rainfall. But like a species of a plant is a species of a plant in the genus, you know, like um, something like a linden tree. There's like four or five different types of linden trees, but they all look like linden trees and they're all interchangeable. Most of the time, like um, like with, let's say, chickweed, for example, there's like four different types of chickweed, but each one looks like itself no matter where it's at. Right. But and they're all food based. So they're safe to use. Um, but OK, so let's see. Um, Let's see. So somebody asked, um, are any infusions helpful for someone that needs to stop menstrual bleeding that lasts too long? Weird question, I know, but it lasted three weeks now. Um, that's not a weird question. We all have human bodies that just kind of like to do these things to us sometimes, you know, alone in that. Um, honestly, I'm not going to say that there's one that will like stop it in its tracks the moment you drink it. But usually when we have um, imbalances like that, it's because we're really like lacking in nutrition. I mean, really, a lot of people, you'd be surprised at how many of your health ailments like resolve themselves or at least lessen when you start deeply nourishing your body. And that includes your womb. Right. And so the two allies for that would be um, ripe clover, uh, but also um, raspberry leaf to really help tonify your womb. But I would really, really urge nettle infusion, too, because you're losing a lot of iron and you're losing a lot of minerals when you're bleeding that long. Um, but even nettle could arguably slow it down a little bit because she does have some of the tannins in her she is pretty drying um and so but most people but look here's the important thing to know about infusions that i probably should have said in the beginning of the video because by now people are checking out probably you know even if you're re-watching the recording but um we're conditioned for things to work quickly right because we live in a pharmaceutical day and age industry right we say i feel this way doctor give me a pill we take a pill and usually we feel different pretty quickly. We're like, good. But when it comes to healing with nutrition, you're like, hey, body, I feel bad. Here's some nutrition. It's like, thank you. But we've got a way to repair. <laughs> so a lot of people are like, I drank it for a week and didn't feel any different. I'm like, no, OK, cool. Come back in three months. Come back in two months. Challenge yourself to keep it up even if you don't feel that instant reaction that you've been conditioned to expect because you are trying to repair depleted nutrients in your body that is not your fault it could be because we had shitty nutrition growing up because we just didn't have the financial privilege for our parents to have money all the time or we didn't know any better or we fought some illness where we couldn't eat well or whatever it is you know give yourself the grace and the forgiveness that these things just happen or we're living in a country and in a world where most of our food is pretty you know genetically engineered and depleted and things like that but it takes time to build this nutrition back up so like when i first started drinking nourishing herbal infusions years and years ago like i it took me a while but i started checking in with my body how do i feel how do i feel that now that it's been a week well not a whole lot different how do i feel that it's been a month a little bit better. How do I feel now that it's been six months? Wow, I'm a completely different person. How do I feel now that it's been a year? A lot of my health issues have resolved, right? Because your body, it, it doesn't have to be forced into these things. It just wants the proper nutrition that it needs. And then when it has these higher levels of nutrition, these herbs that support our natural functions, things start falling back into place. You got to treat your body as a whole, not as individual parts and pieces. Um, and it really just makes a difference for all kinds of issues. Um, okay. 
So somebody asked if infusions are more effective and potent than tinctures. They're different. They're a completely different creature. Um, tinctures have no nutritional value, but they usually have a, a quicker uh, medicinal type reaction, right? But they're not medicine. Don't think of them as that way. Every body is individual and there's no specific dose for each one person, right? But they are something like if I was having, you know, really bad anxiety attacks, I might say to myself, okay, I'm going to use this motherwort tincture to calm myself down. But that, and it's helpful, but it's kind of just a Band-Aid. But I'm going to use nourishing herbal infusions to support my adrenaline function so I stop having these events, right? I'm not to say that like trauma can't cause my stuff like that. But when our adrenaline glands are de depleted from things like caffeine and stress and sugar and shitty food and lack of sleep and all these things that are going on in most humans' life, uh, we tend to have anxiety attacks. But if I start drinking nourishing herbal infusions, it will start repairing my adrenals, right? So tinctures are good for helping with certain situations, but they don't repair maybe um, situations like lack of nutrition and things like that. Um, let's see. Let's see. Question, question, questions. Um, somebody says they have a peppermint infusion. Is that a no-no? Yeah, don't drink that. Don't drink that unless you want to kill off all your gut bacteria and probably make your stomach issues work. You could soak your feet in it. If your feet are sore, you can, you know, um, use it to take a nice relaxing bath for sore muscles and things like that, but don't drink it. Um, so, um, uh, let's see, let's see. Infusions for general depression. All of them. Again, it's the same thing about like the, the bleeding question. Like when we really start supporting our body and you better believe um, lack of nutrition, like deep nutrition definitely leads to depression. It's not the only thing. And there's other factors that we have to face. But when we start like really getting like our health back and like deeply nourishing our bodies, like these things are at least easier to face. Are they lift some, you know? Um. So let's see. Let's see. Let's see. Any other questions? So um, let's see. What is the best seaweed? Well-rounded for maintaining health. Um, I like to rotate through them all. Um, but if I was going to work with one specifically for thyroid health, um, I would probably look at like um, bladder rack. She's a really common one. But I like kombu and I like dulse. Um, and any, all these all these seaweeds are food. Most people's ancestors, if you lived anywhere near the ocean, they were eating all kinds of seaweed, right? And all these herbs that I've talked about too, these were food. Our ancestors were eating these things, no matter where your ancestors came from. There was no one civilization that didn't, civilization that didn't um, eat herbs, right? And so what happened is when we got disconnected from the land and you know, land-based living and all the things that like modern society created and all the horrors that it brought upon everybody, we were using these herbs as part of our diet. And so by proxy, it was just supporting our natural health. Not to say that we didn't have sickness and things back then, but you, you know that like our illnesses now are like a hundred times worse than they ever were because we have really completely removed ourselves from the food system and not just that we're eating like like feedlot stuff and monocrop this and monocrop that that's bad too but we've also stopped looking at herbs as food right there are some places there are some people um where um they even won't eat like wild food because it was looked down upon because they were like, well, when we were starving back then, we were looked at as like really poor and pathetic because we could only eat wild food, which is really sad because they would probably be healthier if they ate more wild food than what they could find in the store shelf or, you know, refined things like that. Um, but OK, so let's see. Let's see what else. Looking for questions. Um Okay. And there's a lot of like repeat questions here, you know, like what's the difference between teen and infusion. And if I keep re re um, replying to the same ones, I'll, I'll, um, I'll uh, be here forever. So if I don't answer your question at the Q and a here, it's likely that it didn't apply to the video that I was doing, or I've already answered it, or I gave the information in the beginning of the video. So you can go back and rewatch all of that stuff. Um, let's see. I think, let's see, let's see. Um, so somebody asked when you're not harvesting your own herbs for infusions, where do you buy your herbs from? Um, I, again, 
I don't actually harvest a lot of my own herbs for infusion unless there's something that's like really easy to do because <laughs> like you would be surprised like at how much you have to harvest and then dry to end up with an ounce of plant matter. Like when I harvest nettle, I would rather take that and cook it and like blanch it and freeze it for wintertime eating than try to dry this big old batch only to get like a couple ounces, which only gives me a couple servings. So it's better to use that as food. And then I hop online somewhere like Star West Botanicals, San Francisco Herb company um frontier herbals mountain rose herbs there's lots of bulk places online and of course if you buy in a pound increment you'll get a cheaper rate per ounce and if you can't afford to buy it all at once consider finding friends to um buy like go in on it like have an herb buying club right you get a discount um in the way that like you didn't have to pay for all of it but let's just like a quarter of it and you guys can split it up um okay let me i'm gonna scroll through for a few more um a few more questions and then i think i'm gonna call it good because i've been on here for two minutes um i'm looking for looking for looking for questions let me check Facebook and YouTube. Um, yeah, I think, I think that is going to do it. I think that's going to do it. And I'm really grateful that you guys are watching me for those who are rewatching or anyone that's watching me now, come find me on Instagram. If you're watching me on Facebook or YouTube, if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, uh, come find me on Instagram. <laughs> I almost lost it there, but the most important message the most important message out of all the stuff that I told you today that I want you to take away with you is to remember that you are absolutely smart enough to do this. And you don't need to pay somebody thousands of dollars or hundreds of dollars or go through some really intimidating course that really kind of just gives you more information that you're going to regurgitate than actually retain and know what you're talking about by just just do it. You don't have to pay somebody to know this. You really, really don't. You can use your own curiosity. You can use the internet, which is free and an invaluable resource to learn about all kinds of things and just jump in and start. Humans learn by doing and you just have to trust yourself. And I really, I really, I really, I know deep down inside of me that you are smart enough to do this. So again, you're smart enough. Um, and if you like me here, um, make sure that you, um, I'm just going to jump into this. <laughs> uh, make sure that you like, comment, subscribe, turn on notifications on any platform that you're watching um, and share this video too when it's done because it really, really helps other people learn that they are smart enough to do this too. It really helps us take our own health back into our hands. We can just give this information out for free. You don't have to pay me for this. They don't need to pay for it. And by proxy, it just ripples out and people learn more and more and more. So, all right. Well, I've been jabbering for two hours now, so I'm going to hop off of here. I'll see you next time. Bye.